Hey guys, I'm John and welcome to Respect Your Intellect. From pretty much any angle we look at things, we see evidence of evolution in the traits we look at. We can look at animals today and see features that either no longer seem to function because they're just part of their ancestry, or they have different functions altogether. Some animals have eyes that no longer work and serve no purpose. Some whales have hip bones that serve no purpose. Some snakes have leg bones buried in some of their muscles. And we ourselves have a lot of features that no longer serve any purpose. Like our appendix, wisdom teeth, goosebumps, as well as many others. In many cases, when it comes to evolution, we can somewhat intuitively make predictions of something we have yet to find, because it's often easy to know what will make something more fit to survive and pass down their genes to their offspring. However, sleep seems to be completely counterintuitive in this regard, because it seems to be a state of total vulnerability to predators. So why did sleep evolve? Hit that subscribe button and let's get started! There's something generally agreed upon by most people today, and that's that sleep has regenerative effects. Sleep is something that's mystified researchers for many decades, and is still today being researched heavily. We now know that sleep re-energizes the body's cells, it clears waste and toxins from the brain, it solidifies important memories while discarding the unimportant ones, it supports learning, it helps our immune systems, it regulates our mood, our appetites, and our libido. With that said, a lot of researchers hypothesize that these things are the reason why sleep evolved, but there's really no evidence linking sleep's regenerative effects with evolution. The regenerative effects that we just listed could easily be accomplished by much shorter sleeping periods, yet we sleep about a third of every day, all at once. It also doesn't explain why sleeping patterns are so different across the animal kingdom. Some animals can sleep for entire seasons, others sleep the majority of every day, and others barely sleep at all, yet they would all benefit from a bit of daily regeneration. The way that sleep works for us is that our eyes go through a state of melatonin production when it gets dark. This melatonin then travels up to the brain and attaches to our neurons, which essentially signals our body that it's time for sleep. Once our eyes start catching light again, the melatonin production is stopped and we regain control. Even though we seem to know what sleep does and how it works, there's still a lot of questions that need answering. One of the things we do in an effort to understand sleep better is spend a lot of time studying different organisms and their sleeping habits one of which is fruit flies. They seem to show very similar habits to what we do as humans. When we interrupt their sleep cycles, for example, it causes them to have longer rest periods afterwards to try and make up for the lost sleep. They also show all the signs of jet lag when we start messing with the light they receive at different times of the day. Even though this research seems promising for helping us understand the effects of sleep, it still doesn't really try to address the question of why sleep evolved in the first place. For that we need to study organisms that give us a link much further up the ancestral evolutionary tree. One of the organisms that we found that could answer some questions is a marine worm whose name I'll just put on the screen. So a study was started at the European Molecular Biology Laboratory in Germany to study everything about it. The study proposes that melatonin production, and therefore sleep, evolved about 700 million years ago in a common ancestor between many different species and these little marine worms. When the worms are about two days old, they're essentially a ball-shaped larva that's lined with tiny hairs that makes them swim. They're also lined with cells on top of them that make the same light-catching proteins that we make in our eyes, to switch melatonin production on and off. During the day when the larva catches light, melatonin production is stopped, and the little hairs beat back and forth to make them swim up. As night sets in, melatonin production turns on, and the hairs stop moving, when the melatonin attaches to the neurons that control the beating hair, causing the larva to sink. So every day these little larvae are moving up and down in the ocean following the cycle of the day, in the same way we do. We also tested them for jet lag and found the same thing we experience ourselves, and just like the fruit flies do as well. 
The fact that the melatonin network is so strikingly similar between these worms and humans suggests that we have a common ancestor. It's so similar in fact that even the way in which melatonin takes over the brain is the same. The melatonin attaches to neurons and causes them to start emitting a regular rhythm of bursts. With these neurons busy doing their own thing, they're no longer relaying information to the rest of the brain. In our case, it's our thalamus that shuts down, while in the worm, it's the part that controls the beating hair. If you weren't aware, our thalamus is the part of our brain that's responsible for relaying motor and sensory signals to the rest of our brain. Which explains why you don't really move much while you sleep, and why you don't really wake up from little noises. Alright, so we covered a lot about what sleep is, how it sets in, and even when it might have first evolved. We even talked a bit about the lack of evidence with the claims that it evolved because of its regenerative effects. So if it didn't evolve due to its regenerative effects, the question still remains. What's our best hypothesis today as to why sleep evolved in the first place? After all, every trait we look at in evolution exists because it contributes to the fitness of that organism to survive and pass on their genes to the next generation. Sleep, however, is a state of total helplessness that doesn't seem to benefit our fitness for survival, at least not at first glance if the regenerative effects are set aside. The first thing we need to look at is what's common among all the species that sleep, and what we find is that even though every species that sleeps have different cycles from each other, they're mostly always aligned with their food sources activity cycle. When you take this into account, it really does make sense that preserving energy when there's no food around would benefit our survival. Another thing that seems to mostly always be aligned is that species sleep mostly during the times of the day that they're the most vulnerable to predators. This is also something beneficial for a species, because you're essentially hiding and regenerating while you're the prey, and using up your energy reserves while you're the predator, and there's a lot more food around. So between a creature that doesn't sleep and takes high risk for very little food, and a creature that avoids risk and uses up its energy when there's a very high chance for success, it's not hard to imagine that the latter will outlive the former. In any case, one thing is pretty certain, and that's that if sleep evolved, it's because it's beneficial for our survival. Simply because every old trait is. It's only in our very recent history that we actually have enough control over our environment to allow the unfit to survive. Otherwise, nature would simply take its course and eliminate the quote-unquote weak. So even if at first glance it seems like the helplessness that sleep comes with would diminish our chances for, uh, for survival, it actually has the opposite effect by keeping us out of harm's way when there's little benefit for the risk and allowing us to concentrate our energy reserves only at times when we have a lot of food around with little risk. We still have a lot of research to do and a lot of questions to answer when it comes to sleep, but I myself am happy we're starting to eliminate some of the old hypotheses that aren't holding up to scrutiny, and coming up with better ones that explain more while being more in line with what we actually observe all around us. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I also want to thank my patrons on Patreon for supporting the channel. I really appreciate the support. If you want to see more answers to interesting questions, make sure you subscribe and click that bell notification so you don't miss out on the next videos in this series. If you have any interesting questions of your own that you've never thought to look for an answer, don't hesitate to write it down in the comments and contribute to this series. You can also check out my website at respectyourintellect.com for all the information and videos on this channel. Until next time, thanks for watching and remember, respect your intellect.